So now let's prove that unlike the rational numbers, which is which are incomplete, the uh, re real numbers are complete, and that in fact every Cauchy sequence of real numbers actually converges. So we have already proved that every convergent sequence must be a Cauchy sequence. So now it remains to prove the harder direction that every Cauchy sequence of real numbers actually converges to a limit, a real number. Okay, and so um, here it basically said, stated what we already said. So suppose that we have a Cauchy sequence of real numbers. Now we want to show that the sequence converges, but so we'll need to show that there is some uh, limit to which it converges, but we have no idea what this limit is. And so just let's keep in mind that finding this candidate for the limit is going to be a step. We'll have to figure out how to find this limit to which the sequence converges. So we'll do this proof in steps. So in the first step, we'll show that uh, the sequence AN is actually bounded and we'll see how this helps us. <clears throat> okay, so suppose that uh, AN is a Cauchy sequence. So for every epsilon, just by the definition, folding the definition of Cauchy sequences, there exists a natural number n of epsilon such that for every n and m that are greater than n of epsilon, uh, this inequality holds. That's nothing new. This is just the definition of uh, a Cauchy sequence. Now, um, since this is for every epsilon, in particular, we could have chosen epsilon to be one or any finite number for this purpose. Doesn't really matter here. But suppose that we chose epsilon to be one, then there exists a fixed natural number n one, such that for every n and m that are greater than this fixed number n one, holds that the distance between a and am is smaller than one. And now using the other part of the triangle inequality, we have that this is greater or equal to that. Now, what this means that um, uh, the absolute value of uh, this absolute value is smaller than one, which means that the absolute value of a n minus the absolute value of a m, that is what's inside the absolute value, is smaller than one and bigger than minus one. But we're only going to use that what's inside this absolute value is smaller than one, and therefore we can transfer um, a m to the other side here. So what this implies is that for every n and m that are greater than n one, we have the following inequality. Now those are for every. This is important. So now um, um, we can choose m, or we can fix m to be this n one plus one, which is a natural number greater than n one, right? And we choose n to be any. Uh, so for every n that is greater than n one, we would have this inequality as we have proved, right? But this is some fixed value, it's constant. And this means that all the values of a n start uh, that are for every n greater than n one, basically infinitely many uh, values, uh, that is all the values of a n except for finitely many are bounded above by this number. And okay, what about the rest? Well, the rest, we only have finitely many and every finite set has a maximal element. So if we were to consider this set of absolute values, which are may not be covered by this inequality, then this set is finite and therefore it has maximal element, right? So let M1 be the maximum of all of those. And then let us choose M to be the maximum of between M1 and this value that we have over here. Uh, and then what we have is that for every N, uh, we have the following inequality because if N is, um, between one and one, then the absolute value of a n would be bounded by this m one, and uh, after that point, it's going to be bounded by that. But since we chose m to be the maximum maximum of those two, then for every n we have that a n is bounded by uh, above by this m, which means that the sequence is bounded. All right. So this is the first step in the proof. But how does this help us? Well, um, if you remember, we have already proved uh, the boltzmann bierstrass theorem that says that every uh, bounded real sequence has a convergent subsequence. Now, uh, we have proved uh, the, the uh, boltzmann bierstrass theorem in a particular method, and we will review this method and we'll see how it relates to completeness. And actually that the completeness of the real numbers stems from the completeness axiom. And the completeness axiom says that every uh, set of real numbers that is bounded above has a supremum. So we'll review this, but Currently, what we have is that uh, this uh, every Cauchy sequence must be bounded, and therefore, um, if a n is a real um, uh, sequence and it is bounded, so our goal is now to find a candidate for the limit. But now we're going to use the Boltzmann-Weierstrass theorem. 
So since n is a bounded sequence of real numbers, so by the boltzano weierstrass theorem, it has a convergent subsequence. So let us denote it by that. So this subsequence converges to this limit L. Okay, so now we actually have a candidate for the limit, and in our final step of the proof, we're going to show that all that the sequence actually converges to this limit of the subsequence. So this subsequence that was chosen arbitrarily, not so arbitrarily, but chose any subsequence of a n, which is convergent, and we are guaranteed by the Bolshevik so Weierstrass theorem that at least one such sequence exists because a n is bounded, right? So we choose this limit of this subsequence, and then we're going to show that this is the limit of the entire sequence. So how are we going to do it again? We're going to use the fact that the n is a Cauchy sequence. So for every epsilon, there exists n of epsilon such that for every n and k that are big enough, so actually we need here uh, uh, nk to be uh, bigger than n of epsilon, but for k that that is big enough, right? Th this um, sequence nk is actually an increasing sequence. So nk is always greater than k. So basically, it is enough to take n and k that are greater than n of epsilon, and then this also means that nk is greater than n of epsilon, and it means that this inequality holds because we can uh, make it for every epsilon, and in particular we also we can also make it for epsilon half. So we have this inequality, right? And now suppose that we fix n and we think of the sequence as only the sequence in k, right? So now we're going to uh, apply the limit arithmetic theorem because you know that the we know that the sequence a and k actually converges to L, right? And suppose that currently we fix n and we consider this as a sequence in k. Then since this converges to L, then the arithmetic limit theorem implies that this limit um, uh, is equal to that. Basically, this limit is a n minus L, right? So like the passing the limit, this is a direct consequence of the limit arithmetic theorem. And therefore, since this is strictly smaller than epsilon half, then when we pass to the limit, then the limit, uh, we can say for sure that this is smaller or equal to epsilon half, and in any event, this is smaller than epsilon. And this concludes the proof, because we have proved that the sequence a n uh, converges to L, because why? Because for every epsilon, we have showed that there exists a number n of epsilon, such that for every n that is greater than n of epsilon, the distance of a n from the limit is smaller than epsilon, so this must be the limit of the sequence. Now, another way to see, the, to see this um, is, um, uh, yeah, the, the proof is completed here, but another way to see this is the following one, again, applying the definition of the Cauchy sequence. Since this subsequence converges to L, right, then there exists a natural number N2, such that for every K that is greater than N2, the distance between this convergent sequence and its, li and its limit is smaller than epsilon half, right? Now, um, uh, and for every N that is greater than N of epsilon, we have that the distance between A and N and the subsequence is smaller than epsilon half. So now choosing the maximum between this n of epsilon and uh, the n and two of epsilon that guarantees this inequality, if we choose n three to be uh, the maximum of those two, then for every n that is greater than n of epsilon, both of those inequalities, this inequality and this inequality, hold simultaneously. And so we again apply our uh, favorite trick with uh, the triangle inequality. So basically we need to show that the distance of an and the limit is small. So we intertwine he here this a and k. So we subtract and add it here and then apply the triangle inequality uh, and we split it over here, right? And so this is smaller than that. And since n is greater uh, than um, n of epsilon because it's greater than n3 and n3 is the maximum of those two, then this is smaller than epsilon half. And since um, n is greater than uh, n2 of epsilon, then this inequality holds. So this is smaller than epsilon half. And as a result, all this difference of a n minus l is smaller than epsilon. And this proves once again that the sequence a n converges to the limit. Now, where is the completeness hidden here? Because here we actually relied on the boltzano weierstrass theorem. But remember that I said that um, deeply the completeness uh, the completeness property of the real numbers actually is hidden in the axiom of completeness. So let us now um, review how we proved the boltzano weierstrass theorem. And so 
let us now emphasize this important point. Using this terminology that we have introduced, that we have this distance function, right? We have proved the, uh, that the completeness axiom is equivalent to saying that uh, the space of real numbers with this metric, this way of measuring distances, because remember, this is uh, x minus one in the absolute value is just the distance between the real numbers x and y, and this is called the standard metric on the real numbers. So if we take the real numbers and this way of measuring distances, then this space is a complete metric space, and this stems from the completeness axiom. And this proof relied on this uh, bolzano weierstrass theorem. We're actually going to show another proof which relies on um, on the Cantor's lemma. But let us review the previous proof. So the proof for bolzano weierstrass uh, theorem that we presented previously in, in this play playlist went as follows. So here are the steps. So first step, we show that every sequence has a monotone subsequence. This is step number one. And then since uh, the sequence, uh, the, again, bolzano weierstrass theorem says that uh, every bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. So we took any bounded sequence, and then we showed that for this bounded sequence, we can find either a monotonically increasing subsequence or monotonically de decreasing subsequence. And this uh, sequence is bounded above and below. So either we are in a case of uh, that we, for every uh, bounded sequence, can find either a monotonically increasing sequence that is bounded above or a monotonically decreasing sequence that is bounded below. But now we rely on the monotone convergence theorem that says that whenever we have a monotonically increasing sequence that is bounded above, then this sequence converges. And the proof for that went as follows. Basically, uh, if we're considering the sequence, then this sequence uh, is bounded. And this is, uh, as I said, it's a bounded set of the real numbers. And by the axiom of completeness, this bounded set from above has a supermoon. And then we've actually showed that the supermoon is the limit. So here is where the axiom of completeness is in and how it is related to completeness and to Cauchy sequences and the completeness of real numbers. So the axiom of completeness is equivalent to saying that the set of real numbers is actually a complete metric space. Right. And uh, we're going to show another proof uh, that is also, also relates to completeness, but based on Cantor's lemma.